but that is of interest. But quite often what happens is, and this is kind of unfortunate where some of these perceptions are, arise where, you know, if people aren't paying attention, then all of a sudden they hear about it, then it's like, how come I didn't know? And sometimes you have to go back and, and look at this stuff. The thing that, um, and I'll use the New Haven, uh, University of New Haven as a, an example here. I applaud the, the effort the Board of Selectmen has made and also the uh, Golf Commission and the work that the Billy Casper has done so far with the golf club. Uh, we obviously, when we took this over initially, we were in kind of a crisis mode when we took it over. Originally operated, and even in our first try with the group that was in here before, we've now learned some things about how, with that arrangement Now we're now dealing with. I think one of the key things, and, and I think that we learned it through the Toll Brothers uh, situation, and that um, that in the end, uh, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, uh, seemed that town residents felt that it went a little faster than it should have. And that could have been the solution, but obviously it didn't, wasn't accepted. I would suggest as we have this particular group together here, which I think is a, a great group of commissions and boards to assist in the process. And I know I've made some comments in previous board of selectmen meetings to, to have a brain trust to work through what the ideas are. You know, you, you've got some on the list here. Let the groups get together, come together, put them up on the blank sheet of paper, put all the ideas up there. Maybe that's one of the ideas up on there. But I think that if we manage the golf course in an opportunist manner where somebody come, something comes along and we run with it without measuring against what we want to do, we're going to have some difficulty. As I said, at one of the Board of Select meetings, I applaud the effort that you made to try to make the Toll Brothers thing happen. Unfortunately, people felt it went faster than they wanted to. And we just have to get kind of, I think, in front of what the ideas are, the plans that we want to have for the country club so that when something comes along that we negotiate matches up to what we want to do. We don't get this resistance. Because I think that as much as the uh, University of New Haven opportunity may be a great one, some people are going to feel, well, that's the only thing that they're pursuing. So I think we should learn a little bit from what happened with a couple of things we've dealt with and just take a breath. Let's, these meetings are good. I think maybe we might want to have more of these where we kind of brainstorm some of the ideas and then match the ideas that come up against what we plan. And maybe it may cost us a little more money because I know myself, you know, look, at five years from now, uh, a Toll Brothers idea was the idea that we should have went with. Well, we passed up on uh, two and a half million dollars of, of tax income. So that's okay. all I have. Any other comments? If not, then let's get to the third item on the agenda and maybe we can just discuss these six options. These are potential future options. There may be others, but these are some that uh, we submitted to the Board of uh, Selectmen about a month or so ago. And did these come out of brainstorming session? Or? It came out of a discussion that we had, myself and uh, Tony Genovese, basically, and we submitted them to the Board of Selectmen for their uh, review. We haven't had any real discussions about them, but, and there may be others. I'm just, this is a, a discussion beginning, I guess. The first of which is to sell the entire facility with a conservation easement. The town sells the entire facility to a buyer and places a conservation restriction on the entire 150 plus acre parcel. And I think that what that would anticipate is it would be sold probably as a golf course with a conservation restriction, but there would be something else. Any comments on that from the assembled commissions we have? Jim. <clears throat> I would love the proposal to be submitted to the town in a referendum so that the townspeople can have a say in that option. Well, that, that would, any, any sale of this property would have to be approved by the town, the townspeople. Could there be a non-binding vote to take, a, take the pulse of the community on that option? But, but how can you well, take hold, a vote? Hold, hold, that, that's sort of a legal question, and uh, I think we've looked into that. I don't think you can take have these advisory votes. Is right. that, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So there's an issue with the number of votes. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have to have all the options out of the town. Yeah. You, are you saying, Jim? Are you saying like this one option? Or or no, oh, specifically no, he, the first option? Yes. I think Jim is Jim is looking to try to get a sense of the community right. through a referendum but as to what they want to do. But I don't think you can do it with you one option. You can't do that. Right. Well, you probably couldn't do it with one option. That question. But you can't do it in an you can't do it in an advisory way. You know. I think you know one of the things that goes along with the brainstorming session, that first option. I think 
the group needs to say, what are the pros and cons of that option? Okay, a pro would be, okay, it's not gonna be developed. That's great. A con would obviously be we would take a bath on the sale. That'd be, you know, and you make all the lists so that everyone makes an informed decision why that option is better or worse than another. Any other comments on that? Well, first, Ed, just just a point of clarification. We're not we're not going to walk out of this meeting with an idea. No, no. So so I think I think really the idea is to just go through the options that we have on the table and discuss them. With the different boards and commissions are going to have to take these things back to their their membership, and this is going to have to be. This is not the last meeting. We're going to have other meetings on this, and we're going to have public meetings where we present these different items as ideas that have been raised, and just trying to get a feel from the commissions first before we go to the town as to what it is we want to look at. And there was one other item that I've been approached by a number of people who had uh, discussed the idea of the, t uh, the town plan of conservation and development be amended to allow a uh, 55 and older <clears throat> community on this piece of property where it's maybe a nine hole course and housing. So that was one other item that I had uh, Heard from a number, number of people. No, that not that one. Not one of those. So you could work that in part six. Yeah. Right, but this would be uh, we'd have to we'd have to uh, change the plan of conservation and development to do that. So and again, that would be a, a townwide process. So I just thought I'd clarify that if there's anyone here that thought we were going to walk out of this meeting with an idea, that's not the case. This is the first of a number of meetings that we'll be having on the club and what we should be doing going forward. So any ideas, you know, you, you, UNH or, you know, anything. If anyone has any other ideas besides these six or seven, please bring them up and we'll discuss those and we'll you know, put them on a board and yeah, pros and cons. Uh, Ed? Uh, I just have one thought on, on option number one, because we have some golf commission members as well as the Billy Casper people here in the room. Um, not holding it to anything, but recent sales of golf courses. Uh, do, do, do you have any opinion on what we're talking about? And uh, you know, do, it, does it really change the picture if it's got a conservation easement on it? Yeah, if, I mean, if you if it's restricted use, you're going to limit yourself to only people obviously who want to operate a golf course for the long term. Um, what we've seen is that you know the, the debt markets are much more difficult than they used to be for golf course buyers. So, substantial amounts of, of equity need to be put up with the financing in the neighborhood of <clears throat> 50 to 65 percent equity in order to get debt financing on a golf course transaction. And, and the multiples of cash flow that golf courses used to trade at are more are fewer and further between um, to find those now. So where golf courses used to trade at nine to ten times their annual EBITDA. Now they're tra tra uh, trading it sometimes five to six to seven times. So you're, you know, you're, the value of a golf course transaction has gone down substantially. Even in the last 24 months, it's been more challenging. So um, selling golf courses right now is challenging in the industry, but it's better than it was a year and a half ago. And I think it'll continue to get better. So. What are the recent sales been? Is there a, is there a golf course in Massachusetts that was sold not that long ago? There are a few in, au in, in, in auctions. Of that have come up, um, I, I don't have that information to recall, but um, certainly, and I wouldn't know what the metrics of that, those particular sales were versus the club's financial history or anything like that. Um, but <clears throat> I know that what we're seeing in the marketplace with respect to you know, asking prices when, on deals that we've looked at, those are kind of some of the indicators of, of where transactions are happening. I think one of the things that would to contribute to what the value of this course is, is how successful it can be operated as a golf course like we're attempting to do now. And having that information may affect what the purchase price, what the ultimate purchase price may be. Yeah. Uh, the trailing, trailing 36 month history is really what an operator will look at to understand what the golf course can, can operate at. And you don't have great history because it was run by a private operator under a lease scenario. So we're building that history for you now. So that's, <clears throat> again, you know, the, the market may move. You know, it depends on how banks are lending and what people are willing to pay. And you, you can be successful in local areas like this if someone were to, buy, to make an emotional buy. A family business wants to own a golf course. And, you know, the, 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 the investment analysis on the, on the return of their money isn't as 
significant of a decision making criteria. So it's, you know, it's not to say that that wouldn't be someone who comes along and says, hey, you know, I grew up in Woodbridge and I have all this money, I'd love to spend it and make sure this stays a golf course. Like Peter Hill, so, maybe. Like Peter Hill. <laughs> He's the president of uh, uh, Billy Casper, who grew up in New Haven and played golf here. He caddied. Oh. tent could stay and everything else could go because the capital investment piece is what we should isolate what it costs to run the building. Could you also take into consideration the amount of money we have to pay to have a space? Right, because the value of the property includes the value of the building, for example. Even though it's what in we're trying to do is try and get some of this revenue back. Right, but I'm just saying right. in terms of gaming it out so we know what we're comparing to. Right. Is it right. listed as another option? <coughs> right now, if I understand it, we're, you're operating at break even to run the facility. That's the we, that's the town's budget. Our our that, expectations are several hundred. Making, but none of the revenue you're making here, at least what was in the in the budget, is in, is going towards debt service. The town is 100 percent paying debt service right now. Our projections are so. I think screw. what she was saying is positive cash flow from the, from the operations before that's, debt. That's your 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 before hope that. and your wish. That's not. Yeah. That's, right. that's our projection. That's not what was in the budget. That's, that, that's right. That's we correct. cut the budget down to right. zero. Right. Right. So, so, right. be, so as it stands right now, <coughs> it's to pay to run the place, right. not to pay down any debt. So right. the, I think part of the question is, if we're already paying all the debt, at what point do, we stop do you stop expenses? everything else and pay it, keep it for the town, develop it? That in, in a totally public manner, um, I think it is something to think about. Okay, uh, Karen. And that, that was, um, I think, some of my consideration just even getting on the board. What do you do? One of the options do could it be a town forest? Could it be a town nature walk? And then I kept thinking, it's like me buying a Lamborghini and not having a driver's license. It's nice and pretty, but what does it do? At least now we have a shot at some positive. And even building fields, that takes an awful lot. Building the fields takes a lot. It probably takes more um, park and rec, more public works, just the upkeep. And when you're not getting anything back on that. So yeah, I think they're, you know, it's great for on the table, but that was part of the thought process even coming and well, trying to at least the, get some positive cash flow. Right. One of the issues in the way I'm looking at it, my perspective, I, I am on the Recreation Commission, and um, you know, available lots, available property in town in order to expand and to do anything with recreation is so so tight. It's it's at a point where you know, beyond the baseball field that um, we're looking at building on uh, Pease Road, it's. We're in a really tough situation here. We have requests, and we're, we're preparing a document that we're going to be sharing uh, with other commissions. But we're, you know, we're preparing, you know, and looking out. We have requests for uh, lacrosse, football, rugby, uh, and a number of other things. That all we ever do is say no. You have no fields. You can't. You can't pursue this. You can't grow your organization. You, there's no fields for you to play on, and there's no real fields or, or property for us to expand and look at to do these things. So that's one of the things that I am interested in is, you know, retaining this property, not selling it, uh, 
uh, to, to a developer or, or selling all of it to, to anyone, but retain at least part of it. And convert it. And have options, and have options. You know, to, to um, I'm sorry, your name was? Karen. Karen, so to your point, indeed it does take a lot of money to build fields and maintain them and things like that, but if there's a need and we were gonna do that somewhere, you know, if this is the place or part of it, then you know I think it's something that we could at least consider. Well, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong at all. But this is the only piece of open space in town that does generate income. So if you it does that has the potential to generate income. Potential. So, right. No, no, I understand. Right. But it's in a as a result of that, and I'm not saying you're wrong, Mike. But it, it it's in a I think it's in a slightly different category, and you'd have to. Take that into account. Well, I think, I think we'll because other we open more history. Yeah. Because I mean, other sure open space, right. no matter what you do, is totally passive in terms yeah, of. Yeah, I mean, and that and that comes down. I mean, that goes to. I mean, that goes to you know what we see, <coughs> 12, 18, 24, 36 months out from that. Um, I mean, I wouldn't suggest well, that's that. Right. Yeah. yeah right, I mean, right, right, that's right. I mean, that's all dependent on, on you know. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I think it's fantastic if 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 the budget is at zero. You know, or a wash uh, for for uh, a positive revenue stream. I mean, if if that's what it is now, that's great. If we could get to three hundred thousand this first year, that would be phenomenal. If we could get to five hundred or more, then that's a whole different thing. That's a completely different thing. Then this really is sustaining, and it would help pay down debt. And and this whole thing, uh, this whole facility would be in a different light, and and can really be built on. Okay. Yes, uh, Maria. Um, okay. I'm, I'm part of the Conservation Commission, and uh, I just wanted to go back when we, when we, um, our commission worked very hard for the town to agree to buy this property, and so, um, and where did, it, where did this all came from? If it came, I mean, perhaps my own position in this was when I heard the history of this golf course. So apparently. I'm not a golfer, but many people that I talked to in town said that it was very well designed and that it, in fact, has a very important history in the greater New Haven area. That once upon a time, this golf course was for, for Jews. They built this because they could not play in New Haven golf course. I'm not Jewish, but mm -hmm. I, I am married to a Jewish guy, and I thought that heritage alone and the fact that it's well designed was worth saving it. What we wanted, the, the Conservation Commission wanted to buy, the town to buy it so we could sell it in total as a great golfing entity. The economy, of course, is tanked, but um, I'm part, this is something else personal on, on my part. My husband and I are part of the PGA golf thing in Cromwell to raise funds for the hole in the wall gang camp. And I see how they struggle and they work, all that kind of stuff. But I think there's a possibility in talking to people around there that's in charge of this, this, go this huge golf course, that there are people that could be interested in it. And we wanted it to sell it, to buy it, to sell it, but so that we could return it to the tax roll. All right? Now, I think the other option like you said, it, it, it's, the only pass, it's the only goal, uh, open space that is potential to make money. The one thing, though, about this first option to sell it, I think it should be settled in some people's minds about why a property in Woodbridge that was being bought by a developer for $3.5 million from a bank why did the town buy it for seven million dollars? We gave you the authority to buy it. Why was it so? Why, why did we have to pay seven million dollars? I think if we can, you know, settle in the minds of our, our citizens what that process was and why it was, maybe we can make these decisions easier or have more options open to us. I have never heard the real story. I mean, you know, here's a property, I want to sell it for three, uh, I mean, I, I could buy it for $3.5 million. I, we authorized somebody to buy it. So I thought maybe we would buy it for five, 
because that gives a lot of leeway, a lot of oh, way to get rid of the developer. No, we bought it for seven. I don't know. And I haven't heard the story, the exact story, why we bought it for seven. That's it. Right. That's really not part of this, but it was the vote of the special town meeting that authorized the Special the town meeting authorized you to pay for it. But why do we pay seven? Don't you think? That's what it could be bought for. That, that, and that's the authority that was given. There were people saying, pay whatever it is. We want this property. I don't think so. I think it was 90% approval. Yeah. But that's not really part of this, what we're discussing here tonight. Right, but the option to, uh, to sell, which is a good one for us. I think it's a good one because that's what we decided. That's what made us want the town to buy it so we could sell it. Maria, just um, just, 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 let me just say one thing. Just to answer your question, why did it cost seven million dollars? You probably know that this was there was a public auction in this building for people to come and buy this club at auction. There was a developer who wanted to put 200, 300, 400, I don't know how many private right. residential units here right. who was getting who was ready to bid very close to seven million dollars. The town would have lost the property, and this would be the site of a fairly significant residential property. Well, if we didn't bid the seven million, that was the cost that was needed to buy the property. We were given the mandate by the Board of Selectmen to go and bid and, and see if we could purchase the property. It took seven million dollars to outbid two other individuals who were very active and who in are those individuals? It was one guy by the name of uh, Sam, Leberry. Sam Leberry and uh, yeah, Reese. David Moore. David buy the note for 3.5 million. But that, he tried, he had a deal with the bank. The owners of the country club said, no, we're still the owners, even though we've defaulted on the mortgage. We want to see if we can get more than $3.5 million so that we can recoup some of our equity. They, and then the bank had to go along with it, so that's why the public auction took place. The owners of the property wouldn't go along with a $3.5 million debt uh, purchase price because they would have gotten zero. This way, they met. They insisted that there be a public auction to see if they can get more than three point five million dollars, and they did. And we could not get this club. We could not keep it off out of the hands of developers if we didn't bid the seven million dollars. And I think everybody knows that. That was the value of the property, so and that really also was, was the, the appraised value of the property. Maria, if, if your goal is if your goal is to sell the golf course, the best way to make that happen is to let these guys operate the golf course and maximize the sales and profit of the golf course for many years from now because we're not going to hit that peak in terms of what it can be sold for for several years out. And one other comment in relation to that, the more times we throw that comment around in the short term, the less chance we're going to hit that goal because that's not too motivating for the staff that, that's here because obviously they're committed to doing what they're doing here. So we're probably in a fairly long commitment here to make this happen if that's our long-term goal. At least that's my thought. And haven't we slipped off the, the agenda? Right. Yeah. 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 Prior yeah. history, yeah. 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 it's not a function of this meeting. Right. Talking about but the options, well, and speaking to Bob's point, the longer we wait, the greater the risk that interest rates will increase. The cheaper the rates are, <clears throat> and they are, they are at record lows presently, the better the chance we have of selling the country. Jim, but there's no cash now, question for you. If you had a fat budget, and would it make an improvement that you saw could enhance the revenue stream here, anything, to increase the value of this business, what would it be? I, I missed the first part of that. If you had the budget, you the had, capital you had budget. the capital, you had the capital to make an investment here that was designed to increase or enhance the revenue stream, what would it be? Well, it's a little premature to make an absolute a sweeping statement about you know what's the best scenario. I, I would I would agree that this building is a, is a challenge. It's a problem. It's not effective uh, for the style of operation that these municipally owned golf courses should operate with. So that's a solution that needs to be determined long term. Um, I think you have a fantastic layout, as you mentioned, about the design of the golf course and the history of the golf course undoubtedly a tremendous layout and allows you to be more competitive than than other golf courses in the community i think um <clears throat> location off the street is something that you have to overcome with with marketing and awareness those things that we're trying to trying to manage towards uh, but um, there is nothing about the business or about the asset that long term would be preventative 
um, or it would prevent driving a successful operation. I think this, this, this clubhouse, though, at some point needs to be wrestled with. You need to decide what, what this is. Is this something that needs to be torn down? Does it need to be renovated? What ultimately needs to be the long-term solution here? You've got you know, engineering reports about the enormity of what it would take to bring this thing up to standard. Um, frankly, this, this style of clubhouse is not, not in play anymore. And it's, this is, a, 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 this is an entirely uh, a rarity in a public golf venue. Um, your typical golf courses today are being built with you know, three to 5,000 square foot clubhouses because they're efficient, they're functional, and they can be high quality. Um, and you're not dealing with the overwhelming member amenities that are needed. And many golf courses that have been built in recent years, clubhouses are not trying to get into the banquet operations because just like any you know, restaurant business, golf business, whatever business you've been in, in the last 10 years, it's been pretty, pretty darn tough. Um, so these types of investments are, are not being made like this anymore. So I think, but it, it's, it's premature to after being here for 90 days to say we have all the solutions. I think what we're doing is trying to get very simplistic, good membership program, good loyalty programs, good conditioning, good guest services, good team trying to you know, really get into a grassroots efforts to understand where that lift is. Frankly, our guests are going to tell us where that money needs to be spent. As we get a better feel for where people want to be, when Anthony's talking to us about having record-breaking weekends and record-breaking participation in the first you know, uh, month of pool operations, well, that, that will turn our sights towards pool investment. When we start to see you know, the memberships grow out on the golf course and we start to look at bunkers and drainage and tees and different things on the golf course, that'll turn our attention to that. So you know, it's hard to say that there's a magic bullet of, of money. Um, right now, if you gave me unlimited access to funds, I wouldn't spend any of it because I'm not, I'm not ready to make that decision. And we've told the town that from the get-go. Put aside that USGA report that you got. Put aside that engineering report that you got. Let us operate this and really show you what you've got so we can say, look, here's where the money needs to go. That's why we've, we've, we've pulled back and said we don't want to spend any of the town's capital money into really, you know, until we really understand where we think it can go. We're, we've gotten to the tenth decision because we think there's an opportunity to go sell a direct revenue stream associated with that. We've pulled back from trying to say go fix this and fix that in this building. We think that would be silly. And we've even, you know, where our expertise is strongest, we've even used um, restraint in giving too many absolute observations on the golf course because we haven't seen water move throughout it enough. We haven't seen what a hot summer is going to produce. We haven't seen what our guests are telling us are the most important things. So we've stuck to the core about just trying to put out a good product every day. We've got big equipment package because we knew we needed that. We really need to let this business mature under this new operation before we can make that long-term decision. I'm, and I'm not skirting around the, the question. It's just it's a very complex understanding of what the business is really going to yield before we can make that recommendation to you. Okay. I would hate to spend money on wisely. You know, we're, we're running a little late here. Why don't we get into the second option here, which is really the first option with the right of the purchaser to have a, a unrestricted 17 acres available for development based on existing town planning and zoning regulations. In other words, the carve out, give the 17 acres would be available for development in accordance with the zoning regulations, but they'd have to be changed if they wanted condominiums, or maybe they wouldn't have to be changed if they just build individual homes, that sort of concept. Is that, uh, anyone have any comments on that? Ed, can you help me understand the sale options with a conservation easement? Does that mean no building construction on the site or no age-limited belt? building on those, that site. What does the as I understand it, the conservation easement would be use as open space or as recreational open space as a golf course as it is but now. Not development for housing of any right. kind. Oh, but, but you don't have to put a conservation now, easement on. Having said that, who do you think is going to pay that kind of money for essentially open space that they can't use? Well, you can right. operate it as a golf course with a conservation right. easement. Well, if somebody else can operate a golf course, we're already in that process. Right. 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 And that, what, what we do here in the next year or so is going to contribute to how successful an operation of this golf course is, given its present condition. Well, there was a conversation when Paul Brothers came in that just selling the 17-acre parcel to Toll Brothers would be foolish because you could sell the entire golf course to somebody else and they could develop it on their own. So if we were going to, so if we wanted to get rid of the golf course later, sell it to someone who would operate, it would be less attractive to them because we've already got the condominiums over there. That was one of the comments that was made 
at the meeting that we should not do anything over there and if someone wanted to buy it and build on that piece of property just like we wanted to initially with Toll Brothers, they would have an opportunity to do that on their own. Does that make sense? Yes, sort of, kind of, yeah. So instead of us developing it and then selling it to another operator with that already right. developed, they would come in buy the whole property, then they would develop it. But again, unless you can keep but the public the housing from going that. out there. That's, Is that correct? No, the easement. You spend money. The easement would only be on the remaining property. It would either be open space or a golf course. So the thought was that you would sell it to somebody as a golf course, and they would develop the 17 acres, as opposed to the town developing the 17 acres and selling the golf course. It incentivizes a certain kind of buyer. So that was that was one of the comments that was made. That. I don't think the question, what do you do with that? that? Exactly. A conservation easement is worth and the value of the land. Two million dollars? Two hundred thousand? I don't even understand what your question. I'm saying you're talking about option two with a conservation easement on selling the property. What do you think a conservation easement would reduce the value of the property? Or be considerable. I would say you're talking 200,000, 300,000? Right. Well, the property had sold on so I feel not right at all. Because that, that would eliminate anybody doing any building on that right. property. Right. That's the point. Right. right. So you can't so sell it. So basically, it, it's going to low, if you do an option two, the value of it's going to be a lot lower by billions of dollars. Am I correct? Option, option, option one, one as well. Option one would be the, the least, would bring the, the value down the most because you're saying a conservation, a conservation easement on all the property. Right. Number two is saying there's a conservation easement on 133 acres, leaving 17 acres open. Well, but, but this discussion loses sight of the fact that options one and two envision a buyer who wants to operate it as a golf course. Right. So the conservation easement does not reduce the value as to that buyer. On the other hand, it secures for the town that it remains a golf course. So it, it's only if you're selling it as developable property that that conservation easement really kills the property. Well, it, well it it's only a golf course. Yeah, but as a golf course, why would you care if there's a conservation But that's what I'm well, saying. Isn't that, I mean, I don't because know. Because you might want to dispose of it. That's, yeah, that's their out. Sometimes they buy it. No, 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 but, but that, that's but what that's, I'm saying. But it but secures that's their for out. the town that it will always be a golf course. Right, that's but I think it does detract from the value, and maybe you know more about this in terms of sales, but if, if a developer, co or if someone comes into one of these golf courses knowing that if they go belly up, well, they're, they're completely stuck in there. They can't sell it to a developer. They can't sell any of it to a developer. So I have to imagine that putting a conservation easement on all 150 acres would reduce the value. Well, when you have that, the land has no value. Right. Okay. So, the so there you go. Yeah. The business right. is what has the value. Right. Carry the paper because you'll be right back into operating it again if they fail. They can't carry it. Right. 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 And it goes back to my point. It envisions a buyer who only is going to operate this as a golf course. So you're sort of right back to where you start. Right. Well, there's an incentive here with these 17 acres of possible development. Correct. So this is just something to talk about. You know? right. Chuck, you had something you want to say? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to take a, a sharp left turn, surprising some of you. Well, that's it. Yeah, I thought it might. <laughs> might. Well, that's, I, that's, I, that's right. I'm, I'm, I'm wounded. I'm wounded. I'm wounded. I'm wounded. I'm not a I, yeah, never. <laughs> I've been listening to this for, for a couple of hours, and 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 here, and I'm looking at this agenda, and and let me offer this up as a suggestion. The folks who are serving on the boards and commissions who are called to this meeting tonight all signed up to get focused on recreation or QPOP or whatever their area of interest in. None of them signed up to be part of a long-range plan of what to do with the most important parcel in this town. And I think to ask them to in any way absorb this burden is unfair to them, not only from a time constraint, which I think can be brutal, but also in terms of their individual skill sets. I'm going to suggest the following. And I'm the last guy to propose more government, believe me. But I think that the Golf Course, Com Golf Course Commission, as it currently stands, has a focus on making this thing operate profitably, and they should continue to do so. 
I think the focus on the long-range destiny of this property is a totally different discussion where the guys from Billy Casper Golf should have to sit here till 9 o'clock tonight listening to this stuff because it's not their problem. It's our problem. I would suggest that there is a different commission, organization, whatever you want to call it, that is charged with getting focused on what to do with this beast. And I think the first order of that business is to not do a vote, but do a survey. Bethany's doing one now. They've got a couple of things that are hot on the agenda up there, and they're calling their residents to find out a sense of what are the highest priorities. Do we want to sell it? Do we want to keep it? What do we want to do? Now, creating a survey like that is, is not an inexpensive thing. It's probably 15 to 20,000 bucks to do it right in a town this size. And it doesn't happen overnight. But before we start getting into the weeds of all these potentially good or bad ideas, where none of us knows a whole lot about it, let's get a sense of what the population thinks are the most likely and best options, and then that organization has a series of hearings with the Conservation Commission or with Recreation to find out how they think the property should go. From there, they can come up with either options to vote in a referendum or put a single option forth if there is a clear sense this is the right thing to do for the property. But I think this, this spitball that's going on right now is not productive. It could go on forever, and it doesn't have any focus on moving this thing down to a logical conclusion. So I'm going to ask you to consider that this process you've got now be reconsidered, and, and that's my two cents. Riffing off that a little bit, the uh, Commission on the Use of Publicly Owned Property is actually created for that. Laura and I are both members of that. Um, that was why that commission was created, and it was to look at you know what was going on in the center of town, but it was the long-term planning for publicly owned property. Now, that's what this is, and Coupop actually had made the suggestion to the Board of Finance that, that you know, Coupop be charged with something. Whether it's a completely new commission, whether it's Coupa, you know, I do think that you need a list before you can go and survey anything. So I think that this first step that we're taking tonight and the drawing this up, each of us bringing this back to our commissions to say, well, is there something else that belongs on the list or is this what we should survey? Is this what we should be asking questions about? I think it's a first step. I'm um, not sure. Someone has to do it. I think a survey is pretty mature. Yeah, before we have options that people can understand, I don't it's think they'll be able to track. I, I would suggest that, that, that the sheer size of this project alone requires a focus of a limited number of citizens to work on just that. Well, Kupak really doesn't have any other work in front of it, right? <laughs> really? It's true. <laughs> But quite honestly, the Conservation Commission is concerned about this issue. That's why Everybody's got skin in this game. Yes. And we have some professional advice here from Billy Casper. This is just the first step in this process. Maybe a survey is something we should consider. I know Woodbridge about 15 or 20 years did it. Maybe we should go back to our commissions and see if this list is enough. And then we go from there. Well, I think that's one of the list we've got so far so people can get a better sense of what it is. Yeah, I think that has cost to some of this, and then gaming out that other scenario about doing nothing to do nothing scenario. It's not right. I'd like to see, you know, if, before we can ask people what they think is the better idea, we need some sense of what it would actually do to the bottom line of the So the, the third uh, option here is the town operates the facility, and that's what we're doing at present with Billy Casper Ball. Uh, the fourth option is the town lease the facility to a third party, <coughs> and that's what we did uh, for, from 2009 to 2011. And in, in, in regard to that process, we only had one entity respond to that. Uh, and then the fifth option is limited development on 17 plus acres. Uh, that can be something we can consider as a possibility. Or the sixth option, sale of all or a portion of the facility for development. Under this scenario, the property could remain an 18-hole golf course, a 9-hole golf course, or a nature preserve based on the extent of the development. So those are all possible options. There may be others. Keep it open spaces, Mr. Helfenbein suggested. So what is the feeling of this group uh, in terms of uh, these options in terms of discussion with your own commission? Yeah, Billy Casper Golf, obviously, having 
those of us have been involved from day one, dealing with the original operator, and now dealing with these guys, I really think we need to give them a chance to see yeah. what, what they're going to produce. I mean, we're here, it's three months. They've gotten off to a slow start because we weren't ready to give them the option. To, they're going, it looks promising. The, the one, two, or any of these ideas of developing or selling, first of all, uh, Greg asked a question, what is a golf course worth? We, look, we need to look no further than Oakland. He paid, he paid a million dollars for half of that golf course, and when the zoning commission asked him if he would consider a conservation easement, he said no. So he paid for half a golf course a million dollars and absolutely refused a conservation easement. So what does that tell you that this place would be worth with a conservation easement? Now, if someone wants to say, well, yeah, but you can't look at it that way because we got those 17 acres that maybe a guy would come in and buy the course and develop those. Playing devil's advocate, who in their right mind would want to take this town on as far as developing those 17 acres? We had people coming out saying there weren't sewers there, there wasn't water there. We had, what makes you think a guy who's going to try and do a similar, op, buy this place and do a similar operation there wouldn't meet all this opposition and, get, and have all kinds of opposition from planning, planning and zoning. I don't think that's a selling point. I really don't think anybody's gonna buy this place with the idea, well, I can really turn a profit on those 17 acres. Because the opposition we heard and we saw on, that, on a, what I thought was an excellent proposal will dwarf in comparison to something more radical than that. So as far as somebody's telling me that this place could sell for $5 million, that, that's ludicrous. There is no way. I think Greg was asking about life, uh, uh, like kind of sales. There was a sale in Massachusetts that we were apprised of. Right. It was a I think it was I think it was twenty seven holes plus hundreds of acres of developable land that went for like one point nine million dollars, right in Long Meadow Mass. So the thought of this place selling for five million dollars is as far as I'm concerned, there is no way. Why don't we give Casper a chance to operate this thing for a full year? Let's see what they come up with. Maybe we can keep it just just the way it is. And hopefully they can turn a profit. The taxpayers are going to come up with some money for the debt service. But every year that's going to go down. And I'm hoping that if they can turn a surplus, that'll, that'll cover a large part of the, uh, of the operation of this place. But anybody who thinks we're going to sell this place for a significant dollar amount, as, as far as I'm concerned, that, that's a pipe dream. Can I ask you a point? Um, I certainly think it could be very constructive to go back to your various commissions and chat about these options, but I would resist the urge to take this formal vote because I think it's a very fluid situation right now. We don't have data in support of a lot of, of any of these options. We have no data. It's extremely abstract. And one of the, we see it here, one of the frustrations that we have in trying to talk about this stuff is that we're throwing spaghetti at a wall to see what sticks. It's just to get juices flowing, okay? And you don't have, I don't think you have to limit it to your commissions. Talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, but, but resist the urge to formalize it in some way. Because it really needs to be a much, I think, my personal opinion, it needs to be a much broader discussion right now about what the right thing to do with the town. Don't forget, you know, if we are somehow are able to reduce, reduce debt service, that's one thing. But if this actually generates revenue and we keep the mill rate down, that's another thing. I mean, there are other considerations that are, we haven't even touched on yet. So talk to your commissions and neighbors, but I, I wouldn't go formal on it, in my opinion. Let it be a chat. So, so the consensus of the meeting. Oh, great. Um, I, um, I would really like us to be able to be able to get the residents to understand if they want option three. You know, what? Uh, well, right now they have option three. Correct. If they want to keep option three, okay. long term, because I, I I agree that it, you know it's too soon to do something, but I still think. We need to be able to flush out some of these options with our best <coughs> estimates of cost. Because it's useless to talk about, you know, selling a golf course with a conservation easement unless we have some idea of what it's worth. Because I suspect it halves the value and it means it's not going to bring in much. I mean, if we're going to try and get residents to give us input, I think we have to attach, you know, some sort of cost to these. Um, the number three, what I would love us to make progress on or, or just know more about is, you know, we've got a good handle on some operations. So that's good. Um, um, I'd like us to have a, a, 
a good handle too on, you know, the uh, that USGA report. I don't remember that much of it, but I thought it like outlined almost two million dollars in what you could spend on the course. <laughs> Tonight, you guys had a meeting, and I uh, there's a total of about two hundred forty-five thousand. That's a much smaller number, but um, but not included in that was the irrigation, which maybe is a half a million dollar expense, whatever. So, I mean, if if we're trying to get feedback from residents or just educate ourselves, we we need to know we need to know a little bit more. And I know the, the golf commission has been very busy, but we would love to know more about the course because. You know, this building, yeah, we talk about leveling sometimes, but of course, what really is going to need to be put into that? Is that going to be shocking to residents that we have to drop a million dollars on a course? Um, and, we don't know that yet. well, why can't we, why, when, when are we going to know it? I mean, I'm not saying it's overdue, but place, we right? don't know that yet. So that doesn't take a year from now. We can. Why can't we get you know thoughts together on what the, what the course may require so we understand the liability of it? They gave us some projections at the golf committee meeting a little while ago about what they thought they needed to. to, to their best Two hundred and forty-five thousand five hundred, and that is not needed right away. That's over a period of time, as needed. Some the, it, something bad can always happen. You know, there's no question. But I guess what I'm saying is I'm not criticizing what anyone is made for projections, but they're really broad, and mm -hmm. they seem to be all over. I mean, a, a year ago, I was looking at a USGA report that said we needed to invest $2 million to get the course up to snuff. Now, we have 245000 you know. Right. 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 The USGA right. report never contained any, any dollar information about possible expenditures on the golf course. What they did do is they highlighted specific areas of concern which had been identified by the prior operator who claimed that all those items totaled up to more than two million dollars. So a point I'm making is I would like to be able to <coughs> look at option number three and have residents in town and ourselves as boards understands some of the long-term projections that we're getting into. And I, and I understood Brian to say right. that with a blank check, he, he would leave spend it, it blank. Right. So we're going to have to be patient, I think, to get what you're asking for. And, um, and, and I made a note right here. We're three and a half months into a process that, again, I understand takes 36 months before anyone has a, has a sense of what this business does. So. Um, we'll all take a deep breath and keep the juices flowing. Right. So, so it is. Right. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. No, Karen. I'm sorry, just Karen. One comment that USG report that you mentioned. Many of the firms we um, interviewed, um, Billy Casper and also Kemper, two national firms, all s said the same thing: don't put too much weight in that because that was a concern, and they, um, in fact, if it wasn't your firm, it was another one who said that those are put together and it's like the superintendent's best case scenario. If he could have anything in the world and do everything that he wanted to on a course. But um, I believe everyone we interviewed um, said we went through the course and you don't need all this. We wouldn't recommend coming in and doing all these things recommended. And I think we're learning, you know, with Dennis and we have a crowd here and I felt good. I mean. Billy Casper is a quality company also whose name is on this course as much as, you know, the commissioner and all of us. But I, too, looked at that report, and, and it um, is a little intimidating. So I, I felt good that it wasn't Billy Casper. It was Kemper and I believe at least two other firms that we interviewed gave us an idea of what is in those USGA reports. Any other comments? I just want to maybe yeah, get Ed, the, Yes. I'd just like to say, I, I, I think that it sounds like from different people that play golf, I don't play golf. I don't either. That, that somewhere along this course has improved with them running. And I think you've got to give them the opportunity. I think this is too early to start talking about options. The only thing they have done when they've been here is improve this course. And by improving the course, it improves the value of the course. 
So I think it, it's a little early to start going all these options, give them the opportunity to finish up what they're doing today. And, and I I'm, think we ought to keep with option three. So the, uh, but I think there is a consensus that uh, the various commissions who are here should take back these options to their commissions, have a discussion about them, see uh, based on the present state of knowledge that we have which one uh, they think we should uh, consider. And also as to the others, what additional uh, information would they need to further understand those options? And one of which are the first one, the sale with a conservation easement. What effect, what, 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 for, we paid $7 million for this property. What do you think we could get for it if we sold it with, for a conservation easement? And whatever that number is, which is going to be less than $7 million, is the town willing, would the town be willing to, to take that and say, okay, we're going we're gonna to eat that money and it's going to be a conservation easement. Forever. That's what you would have paid for the open space. Right, right. So the, the idea here is, is that with a country club, with a golf facility, if we can have open space with an income stream to defer the cost of the bond payments, then I think, I think we're ahead of the game because that's the only open space in town we have. And, the, and basically the facility and the, and, the, and the course itself remain as, as it was historically. So that's... That, that's one thing to think about. So with that, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.